OK. Hi, guys. Um, I'm just going to go over a problem that we did yesterday. Um, and I think it's probably useful to see it again, done maybe in a slightly different way, just sort of drive home these concepts. Um, so the question we have is we have a loop of current, or sorry, a loop of wire, which is in blue here. And it's in a magnetic field, which is these red Xs. Um, and the question is, the loop is going to spin at some constant rate. So we have this loop, say, here. Here's our blue loop with the wire coming out like that. And we want to know if the loop spins at some constant rate, we want to know at what point in the loop's spinning is the maximum induced current, is the current induced in the loop maximum. OK. So there's a couple things that we want to look at in order to start this, right? So we're trying to find the maximum induced current. right? That should tell us immediately that what we need to find, if the resistance in the loop is some number, is the maximum EMF that we can induce. Okay. We also remember that the induced EMF is proportional to the change in flux, delta phi, over the change in time, delta t. Right? And this is the crucial part of this, that what we really care about is how fast the flux is changing. It doesn't matter how big the flux is. It doesn't matter how small the flux is. All that matters is how fast it changes. Okay? And we're going to write one more equation on the board here. Right? Obviously, if we want to know how fast flux changes, we need to remember what flux is. And flux is, here's our equation, BA cos theta. But what that means is that we're going to look essentially at how many of, of our arrows here poke through our loop and how big the loop is, right? So there's how big the field is contributes, how big the loop is contributes, and also the orientation of the loop in the field matters. OK, so I've drawn the, the problem over here sort of in a slightly different, so I've taken the picture here and I've just rotated it. So now we're looking to the side of the loop. And we're going to draw a couple different orientations for our loop. So here's one orientation where the loop is totally perpendicular to the field. Right? There's also an orientation where the loop is totally parallel. And then you can imagine any, any multitude of orientations in between here. OK. So let's ask ourselves what the flux is at these two points. So let's call this orientation 1 and this orientation 2. So the flux in position 1, well, we have our b at some number. But it's not going to change, right? The B is a constant thing. And we have our area. And in this one orientation, we have the full area, right? There's no, there's no angle, so it's just A, and the cosine theta is 1. So our flux in orientation 1 is just the magnetic field B times the area of our loop. OK, what about in position 2? Well, in position 2, we have the full magnetic field, we have the area, but the cosine of the theta is now 0 because the theta is 90. So we get 0. OK, in case anyone is confused or unsure about how Dylan knew that theta was equal to 0 or 90 and what cosine theta was equal to, just check out the additional video linked in the description down below where Dylan explains it in just two minutes. You can also just click here. And here is where I implore you <laughs> to stop and not finish the problem here. Because just because the flux is 0 does not mean that the change in flux is not 0. And this is the key realization about this question. Again, it's the change in flux that, that will cause an induced EMF and not the flux itself. So just because this flux in, in position 1 is greater than in position 2 doesn't mean that the induced EMF is bigger in 1 than in 2. So, but we need to figure out in which one of these two cases, or in any of the cases, <clears throat> is the flux changing the most. <clears throat> and here's where you can do it like we did in class, and I think in class we did it in a very mathematical way. Um, but here's where you can think about conceptually what is flux. And remember that flux is the amount of, you know, 
heuristically, is the amount of exits that poke through my loop. So in this case, I have you know, four exits, and as I rotate my loop more and more, until I'm, you know, until I'm here, I'll cut off fewer and fewer x's in my loop. They poke through it, and so the flux will go down. Okay, so let's look at this, this side view here. So I have my loop that starts like this. And it starts with four arrows poking through it. Say. And as I rotate it a little bit, some angle, you can see that the number of arrows is not going to change that much. Right? If I draw my arrows really densely, if I draw a ton of arrows here, maybe I can cut off one as I rotate my loop. Maybe just the top and just the bottom cut off. But most of the loop, most of the arrows haven't been cut off by me rotating my, my, my loop here. Okay, so what that tells me is that the flux isn't changing very much. Remember, flux is how many arrows poke through my loop. So if I rotate it some amount, and the number of arrows doesn't change, then the flux doesn't change. OK, that's case one. Now let's look at case two. So case two, I start like this. Right? And there's no arrows poking through my loop. And if I rotate it by the same angle, you can see I've added five arrows, maybe, six arrows. And I've rotated it by the same angle. And what that tells me is that I've added more flux to the loop in case two, by rotating it by the same amount, then I've taken away in case one. And that's the idea behind flux and changing flux. Right? Is that it, all that matters is how much it changes. And in this case, I change more by rotating the same amount than I did in this case. So that tells us that, in fact, it's position two that has the greatest EMF. So it's position two where the, where the maximum, where the current induced is a maximum. Cool. So in conclusion, as the loop rotates around here, right, in position one, as it rotates, the same amount of rotation doesn't add or change, doesn't add or subtract that many arrows that are poking through this loop. And so the flux doesn't change that much. But as it rotates through position two, the same amount of change in the angle, the same rate of change causes a much larger increase in the number of arrows that come through. So as the loop rotates around, as it passes through point two, it has the greatest change in flux, it has the greatest induced EMF, which means it has the maximum induced current at point two. And in fact, the least induced current at point one, where the change is almost nothing as I rotate. Okay. I hope that helps. <laughs>